Good morning. Thank you for joining us for another Sunday of our virtual worship service here at First Presbyterian Church of San Antonio. My name is Alex Clary. I'm the ministry director to youth and their families here at FPC. And we are so excited that you and your family have taken time to join us as we worship the great and awesome God that we serve. We have a few announcements before we get started. The first is I would strongly encourage you to click the link below this video to take you to our virtual friendship pad page. This gives us an opportunity to keep a record of who has joined us in worship, as well as provide us an opportunity to connect with our covenant partners and our first time visitors alike to let you know all that God is doing in the midst of our church and find ways for you to get involved. Also want to let you know that we are still encouraging you to offer your tithes and gifts to the Lord. We have three ways that you can do that. You can do that through our church website. You can do that through our app on your app store. It's the FPC app. We would strongly encourage you to check out that app that has our calendar. It has mission opportunities. It has updates on the church body as a whole. And it also provides a way to offer your gifts, your gifts and your tithes. Also, you can mail a check to First Presbyterian Church. Please continue to give back to the Lord what he has blessed us with. Also want to share some good news about some mission opportunities that we have seen through our church. We have delivered 700 bags of cookies and over 600 cards to the staff at Southwest General Hospital here in San Antonio. We are so grateful for the servant hearts that our hospital workers and our care workers have shown to the, our city. And we wanted to provide an opportunity to encourage them, to lift them up, and let them know that they are displaying the gospel through their actions of serving their neighbors. So thank you to all of our healthcare workers, and thank you to our volunteers who were able to help support these mission opportunities. Now, we would like to go to our call of worship as we begin our service. It will be from Psalm 102, verses 25 through 28. Let us worship the Lord together. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. Let us pray. God, in the midst of our confusing and trying times, Lord, we have the truth of your word, and your word says that you are eternal. You are secure. You are never changing. You are the God of yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus, we trust that you have our futures. You have our plans in your hand. You are sovereign. You rule over us, and you are worthy of that title. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you have given us. We thank you for allowing us the means to gather together as a congregation to worship you, to worship 
the work that you have done and worship who you are. We thank you for your son who displayed the ultimate acts of self-sacrifice and service by coming to this earth, living a perfect sinless life and dying on the cross. And Lord, we pray that you would remove the distractions, you would quiet our hearts and minds that we could focus on these things today. We pray that you would assure us with the security that you offer. We pray that you would assure us with your comfort. We pray that you would assure us with your word. Let your spirit move now through this service. Will you reach those who need to hear your word? And may we spend this time glorifying you and lifting up your name to proclaim you are the king of kings and you are the ruler of our world. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen. is abundant in grace and mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In response to his grace, it is right for us to worship him through a time of confession as we agree with him in our sin and experience the depth and the height of his love and his grace found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We join me in praying the prayer of confession printed on your screen, followed by a time of silent and individual prayers. Let's pray together. Eternal and loving Father, you comfort, support, and encourage us. Your goodness and kindness go beyond our understanding. Your grace is richer and deeper than we can begin to comprehend. Yet despite your gracious love and faithful care, we seek to go our own way and we trust our own resources. Time after time, we choose our plans over your will. Over and over again, our pride, self-reliance, and self-centeredness lead us astray. We confess that we are sinners in need of forgiveness. We admit that we are flawed, broken people in need of mercy. Through the person and work of Jesus Christ, forgive us for all the times we have failed you. Cleanse our hearts and make them fresh and new. Renew our minds for your kingdom's sake. Empower us to be your son's disciples for his glory. 
We pray through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Hear us now during this time of silent and individual prayers of confession. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers, and we ask that the reality and the power of the gospel would heal our hearts and give us hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Christians, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, then you can be confident that the promises of the gospel are true for you. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us of all unrighteousness. That God, in his unending mercy, removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west, and he gives us the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. In him we have forgiveness. Thanks be to God. Let's respond to the grace of God through standing together and saying that which we believe. In response to God's grace, Christian, I ask you, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. First Presbyterian Church. My name is Dawn White Fosdick, and I'm the President and CEO at Christian Assistance Ministry, or CAM as you all know it. I've had the privilege of working here for 10 years, and I just could never have imagined that on my 10th year I would be serving during this pandemic, during this COVID virus. It, it really is unbelievable. But I just wanted to share with you that. Um, We've been so grateful for your ongoing support as well as your support during this crisis. CAM's mission, as you know, is to share the love of Christ by providing immediate assistance and encouragement to people in crisis. And we've always done it kind of in a model of an emergency room kind of situation. And I have to tell you that that's sort of the silver lining in all of this. We've been prepared to sort of stop what we were doing, to pivot, to focus on emergency assistance and quickly get it into the hands of those that need it while protecting them and ourselves. Um, I'll have to tell you, we were scared when we heard that places needed to shut down and yet we needed to stay open. We didn't know what that would look like, um, but that's another silver lining. God has shown us over and over through ministry support from churches like yours and, and individuals that we need to stay open and that he would provide. Um, currently, we're focusing on food and financial assistance for prescriptions for clients. We're offering showers, weekly clothing, food six days a week for our unsheltered homeless. And now we're gonna be starting to help with utilities and rent for some of our home-based clients. The thing is, we couldn't do this without you. We couldn't do this without the Lord. This is not us. So thank you so much and just keep praying for us and know there is more to come. We're going to be needed for many more months. Thank you. Philippians 4, beginning with verse 4, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, 
will guard our hearts and our minds through Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do pray for that peace that passes all understanding to guard our hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. We are thankful for your perfect love that casts out fear. Your faithfulness in our lives has carried us through the weariness of the last few months. Thank you that you are in control. Help us to understand that your thoughts are not our thoughts and your ways are not our ways and give us confidence in your sovereignty. We are overwhelmed by the far-reaching effects of COVID-19. We pray for families who have lost loved ones, both locally and globally. Provide for their needs emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Help them to be gracefully walking through the valley of the shadow of death and to feel your presence with them. We pray for healing for all who are hospitalized and separated from their families in their greatest time of need. We're thankful for doctors and nurses and all support personnel who are taking risks and working long hours to care for those who are ill. And we are thankful for all who have survived COVID-19 and have been released from hospitals and we pray for their continued healing. We pray for your wisdom and guidance and protection as cities and states and countries begin to reopen in order to turn the tide on the complications that we have experienced. Give us patience and common sense as we venture back to find a new normal. We are thankful for our church and for the opportunities that we have had to participate with our local and global ministry partners like Christian Assistance Ministry. Provide the resources for them to respond to the upsurge of needs and give us wisdom and direction as we seek not only to survive these days, but to thrive as a church body and to come out stronger than we have ever been in our understanding of our mission and ministry for your kingdom purposes. In the wake of what's happening around us, help us not to overlook the needs of our church and our congregation. Thank you for elders and deacons and covenant partners who have been connecting and caring. We are thankful for the technology that has kept us together even as we have been apart for so long. Thank you for showing us the importance of what we do together outside of meeting on Sunday mornings. Keep us faithful in our giving of our tithes and our offerings and our time and our talents. We pray for the days and weeks ahead. Guide us to be bold and responsible as we learn to adjust to continued sanitizing, wearing face masks, and new levels of social distancing. We know that this is not a mystery to you, and as we continue to walk through these days, help us to live as Jesus taught us to live, to love as Jesus taught us to love, and to pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. My name is Candy Wagner, and I've been a member partner at First Presbyterian Church for about 15 years. This morning, I wanted to share a little bit with you about what I've learned about God and myself during this COVID-19 stay in shelter. I have somewhat of a unique experience in that I actually had the virus. On March 20th, thinking that I had bad allergies, I went to my doctor to get checked out and found that I had all the symptoms of the coronavirus. He gave me a prescription for an inhaler, told me to get some Tylenol, go get in bed and sequester myself. The next day I realized I did have a little bit more than allergies and during the next eight days with the help of my daughter and my family and my first pres family who delivered everything I needed or wanted to my front doorstep, I finally started feeling better. And after 10 days, I was pronounced negative. 
Little did I know that was the easy part of the COVID-19 virus. Even though I was pronounced well, I was still considered high risk, so my sequester was of the strictest kind. And on, as I started feeling better, it was starting to get to me too. You see, I live alone and these four walls, no pets, nothing, these four walls and me were starting to close in on each other. I was liking this less and less and I realized that when Alexa and Siri and I were carrying on a three-way conversation that maybe something had to give. But no matter how alone I felt, God showed up in so many ways. And I had another problem also. I'm also prone to anxiety and panic attacks, which didn't help much in this situation. And the more antsy I became, the more Christ got to work. When it felt like a perfect storm was brewing, out of nowhere, a perfect verse would pop into my head. When I'd look at Instagram to try to divert my attention, a devotional would show up that would mean so much to me. Or I'd start humming and singing the perfect calming hymn in my head. If I'd fallen in a hole with no one to talk to, God would drop me a rope in the guise of a friendly phone call or someone dropping off a surprise on my front porch. He was always there, but he also had an army with him. My family, not only my own family, but my first press family. What would we do without that family? And there's one more thing that I realized through all of this. As I was randomly reading Bible verses, the word plan kept popping up. God doesn't do anything by accident. And in this crisis is no accident either. God has a plan and I can feel it as easily as I can feel the Holy Spirit moving among all of us. Maybe God gave us this time to get ready. As Bob said in a sermon a couple weeks ago, when he was quoting 1 Peter about always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Well, God gave me lots of hope. He's shown me I'm never alone. He'll always take care of me. He'll always throw me a rope. And he has a plan. And I need to be ready for that. I need to be ready to boldly show my love for Christ and for one another and for this city. Maybe we were made for a time such as this. Remember, stay safe, stay well, wear your mask, and relish the hope we have in our risen Christ. God bless you. Good morning. For a couple Sundays now, we've been talking about the witnesses to the resurrection. These are the people who saw the risen Christ and who shared their stories with the world. As we talked about a couple of weeks ago, a witness is someone who sees something, who knows something, and then says something. The risen Christ revealed himself then, and he continues to show up to people today. But how does Christ show himself to us now? Today we're going to read a story about two disciples who met the risen Christ and then shared that story with the other disciples so that we could know about it today. As we read this passage, God's word is going to tell us how Jesus showed himself to those disciples back then and how he continues to reveal himself now. So let's turn to Luke chapter 24. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Let us pray. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. For it is in the name of your Son, our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. So why am I preaching to you from my home today instead of from the sanctuary or Westminster Hall? Well, about 10 days ago, my wife Morgan and I were tested positive for exposure to the coronavirus. I'll confess to you now that I've tried to carry myself with confidence and courage in public, 
but there have been some dark and scary moments, wondering if at any time the virus might latch on and become a problem either for me or for my family. My greatest fear, however, has always been that I would somehow inadvertently pass the virus on to someone much more vulnerable, one of the precious people in our church or in my neighborhood. I mean, as a pastor, I cross paths with lots of people who are, who are in that real health risk danger zone. There have been moments at which I've not been at my best in this season, moments that I've not been proud of, moments of fear and moments of great annoyance, moments of anger and moments of doubt. And in those dark moments, I have asked and I have prayed, okay, God, where are you? I'd really like to see you right now. People are scared, and that includes me. People are losing their jobs. People are getting sick. People are worried. People are scared of us, my family, because we have the virus, and we are scared to infect anybody else. And I keep praying, Lord, now would be a great time for you to show up and show yourself. Where are you hiding? I mean, there's never been a point when I doubted that God was real or that Jesus is alive. But I would sure like to know, okay, God, where are you? But in addition to those dark and confusing moments, there have also been moments of great light and great clarity. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How the risen Christ shows himself to us in the ordinary course of our lives. How does he go from being hidden to being right here? There are many times when we know that God is real and yet he seems hidden from us. And over the last 10 days, this passage that we read this morning has been very important to me because this is a passage about a time when Jesus, though present with two of his followers, was hidden. So how did the risen Christ show up and reveal himself to his disciples on the road to Emmaus? And further, how does he show up to us now? Well, let me give you four points to think about. First, Jesus shows himself to us through people. These two disciples were getting out of Jerusalem. We don't know if they were fleeing in fear of arrest or imprisonment, or if they were just leaving because they were brokenhearted about the death of Jesus. Maybe they needed to be back home with their families because they'd been separated from them for a long time and it had been far too long. You know, we don't know why these two guys were on the road out of Jerusalem and on their way to Emmaus. We don't know why they were leaving. What we do know is that as disciples of Jesus, their world had fallen apart. As far as they knew, the life they knew as followers and the life they were expecting to continue to learn and grow with Jesus and to share his love and change the world, as far as they knew, that was all over. I mean, first, there was his horrible death. He'd been arrested. He'd been tortured. He'd been betrayed by his own people in the crowd and then crucified by the Romans. And then there'd been darkness and an earthquake. And people all over the city, both his followers and his enemies, were completely unnerved. It was a dangerous time. It was a chaotic time. It was a tense time. And it was a good time to get out of the city. But then as they were walking, this stranger approached them. The scripture says that while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. The first thing we need to understand in this story is that Jesus always comes to us first. He knows what we need before we act. He is the one who initiates this contact. He makes the first move, and this time he did it in person. You know, he seemed like a nice enough person. As a matter of fact, it seemed that there was something really special about him, something appealing, if not irresistible. There was something moving about him that they would later describe as a burning in their hearts. The only surprising thing about this new acquaintance was that he had not heard about everything that happened in Jerusalem over Passover. He hadn't heard all the big news. He said to them, what's this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? How could he have not heard about the biggest news event of the year? That Jesus, the miracle worker, 
the wandering teacher. Some said a prophet of God had been nailed to a Roman cross. And, and then, as if that wasn't enough, now there were rumors that some of the women who followed Jesus said that they had seen him alive. I mean, it would be like talking to someone now about the coronavirus and the person says, well, what is that? What's the coronavirus? I mean, it's only been on the news 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the last four months. But I want us to focus on something here. Jesus came to them in person. Another way to put that is that he came as just another one of the guys. He came in simple humanity, but he came in this hidden form. The story says that their eyes were kept from recognizing him. One of the things that has always fascinated me about this story is that when Jesus came to these disciples on the road, he hid his identity. He hid himself. I don't know if somehow our Lord supernaturally disguised himself or used some special spiritual camouflage so that he would not be recognized. Maybe it was just circumstantial. Maybe they were just distracted. Maybe their minds simply wouldn't allow them to reconcile his sight, to recognize him. They just couldn't believe it. Maybe he just had the hood of his cloak pulled tightly around his head so that his face was shaded and they just couldn't see him and they didn't want to stare. But for whatever reason, for whatever reason they didn't recognize him, he did. He came to them as just another person, a stranger, a guy they met on the road. He was wearing the mask of common humanity. I think about that old reality show, Undercover Boss. The idea behind the show was that a major CEO would pretend to be a frontline employee of his own business and go undercover just to see what it was like to be an employee of his own company, to find out what it was like to work on the ground level and to find out how the employees felt about their environment, to find out about their needs and to, to really get to know them as people and not just as figures on a, on a spreadsheet. Maybe Jesus wanted to be with his disciples in a way that made them drop their guard. He wanted them to speak freely, not to speak to him as their rabbi or their master or their teacher or their Lord. I mean, that was the reason the word of God, the son of God took on flesh in the first place, was it not? To understand our joys and our struggles, to live as one of us in the mud and the blood and the mess and the stress of human life so that we would know that he understands us, that he gets us. And so Jesus approached them wearing the mask of common humanity as just another person. One of the most palatable ways that Jesus reveals himself, that the risen Christ revealed himself, is through people. Whether it's people with whom you are spending this quarantine, a friend or a family member, or through church members who are making cookies or sewing masks or feeding health care workers. Christ often comes to us in human form. Christ comes to us as people we know, and he comes as the stranger. He can be someone you meet in the grocery store or the people who are serving on the front lines in hospitals or health clinics. He can come in the face of a child or a senior or a teenager. Whether it's in the person in need who stretched to the breaking point by health or economic needs or the grocery store workers and delivery guys and restaurant workers, who are making sure that everybody still has food on their tables. It's in the face of all those office workers and maintenance people and critical need essential workers. God is always there, but we don't always see him because we're too distracted by our own stuff, by our own troubles, by our own temptations and selfishness, by our own joys and our own busyness or our own plans and strategies. And we have to remember that the risen Christ shows himself to us, not just in the healthy, but especially in the needy. In Matthew 25, the Lord says, For I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was a stranger, I was naked, I was sick, I was in prison. And then the righteous will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or in prison? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Remember that the wounds of Jesus were still visible on his body. A reminder that he still, even after the resurrection, still feels the pain of the world. 
I think the Lord is saying, I may be hidden, but I'm hiding in plain sight. And when I'm not looking for God in these places and these people in these times, I usually miss him. Second, Jesus connected to them through scripture. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. While they were walking on the road, the Savior took that travel time to divinely and painstakingly go through all the scriptures of all the things that we would call, all the parts of what we would call the Old Testament, and show these two disciples how those scriptures related directly to his life, to his death, and to his resurrection. Now, I believe that this conversation was not simply casual talk, like the kind of conversation that one has on a long car ride on a road trip. I think this is something significantly more important than that. I think Jesus was giving them a supernatural download of the gospel, the gospel and the gospel before the gospel in the Old Testament. He was giving them a master's level course in the Bible, the master's level course in the Bible. Through his elucidation of the scriptures, Jesus was giving them a head level revelation of himself. I mean, here you have the living word of God, Jesus Christ, connecting the written word of God to himself. He was saying, look here in this passage, you can see me here. Look in another passage, you can see me here. Look here, this is about me, and so on, and so on. And that's what he does with us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ shows himself to us through his word. Not just in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament. Because the Bible is not just a historical report of something that happened to someone else a long time ago. It is the way that Christ reveals himself to us now. And when we read about Jesus showing himself to the disciples at the empty tomb or in the upper room by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's like we are there to hear him ourselves. Next, Jesus shows himself to us in prayer. Prayer, if nothing else, is time spent with God. Usually when we think about prayer, we think about talking. We think about prayer as asking for things or confessing our sins or uttering words of adoration or interceding for other people. All of that is very important. But if you look at the life of Jesus, you'll see that prayer is anchored in just committing to spend time with God. Prayer is time we spend waiting on the Lord. One of the most precious gifts that Jesus gave these two disciples on the road was the gift of time. He was obviously with them for hours. You know, anyone who's ever met a celebrity and spent one or two minutes to five minutes with that celebrity will brag about those five minutes like it represents a lifelong friendship. I once met an NFL quarterback in a gift shop. The interaction I had with him could not have lasted more than about five seconds. And yet here I am, 20 or more years later, still talking about it. How much more valuable is the time of the Son of God? Time with the Son of God? And God gave them hours of instruction and fellowship. All of this time. I'm sure they told that story over and over for years to come. They could legitimately say that the creator of the universe, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords had spent real time with them. And they really knew him. The essence of prayer is not the words we speak, but the time we spend with God. But if you need words to back up this argument, look at what they say to Jesus. They tell Jesus about their problems. They tell him about the crisis. They ask him questions. And finally, they ask him to stay with them. The scripture says that when they came to a roadside inn, and it looked as though Jesus was going to continue on the way, then these two disciples invited him to stay with them. Stay with us, for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. Beloved, that is a prayer. Be a part of our lives. Would you please join us? Would you please take us on the way? They invited him to be a part of our lives. They asked him to continue as part of their journey. That sounds like a pretty good prayer to me. 
expressing our need, asking God questions, asking Him to remain with us and to abide with us. The point is that you cannot get to know God if you don't spend time with God. Not just talking, but listening. Of course, you can pray spontaneously when the thought strikes you or the Spirit moves you. But our relationship with God really grows when we set aside time and when we deliberately make time to spend with God. That is when He really shows Himself. Finally, Jesus shows Himself to us in worship. The story goes that Jesus sat down to eat with them at this roadside inn. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he, and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Here the resurrected Jesus did the same thing with these Emmaus Road disciples that he had done with the apostles on the night before he died. And in that act, Jesus connects the last supper that he shared with the disciples before his crucifixion to the first recorded meal that he shared with them after his resurrection. Perhaps they had heard stories from the apostles about that last supper on that faithful night. That on that night he was betrayed and he had given them a sign of what was to come. That his body would be broken and his blood would be poured out for the setting of a new covenant and the forgiveness of their sins and our sins. He had done that as a sign. And he had said, do this in remembrance of me. Holy Communion is a sign that points to the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. But thanks to this episode on the road to Emmaus, it's also a sign pointing to the resurrection. Holy Communion is a sign. And that means that it is a tangible reminder of a supernatural reality. Jesus has given us this physical sign as something we can see to remind us of what we cannot see. As the ancient fathers of the church said, it is a visible sign of God's invisible grace. In the institution of the Lord's Supper, on the night before he died, Jesus had used the bread and the cup as a sign to point to the reality of his sacrifice. He was saying that my sacrifice for you is as real as the bread you put in your mouth and the cup you bring to your lips. And whenever you see this sign, remember me and what I have done for you. And then here at this table in Emmaus, Jesus takes the same act and uses it as a sign pointing to the proof of his resurrection. And by the Holy Spirit and by the declaration of the Son of God, God the Father has empowered the sacrament of communion, that sharing of the bread and the cup as a physical reminder that He is real, that He died for our sins, and that He is alive now. You see, worship is not just an exercise we perform. Worship is a sign given to us by the Lord that directs us to the reality of God. Our prayers, our songs, our liturgy, our words, our teaching, our scripture readings, our offering, the sacraments, and even the beautiful facility in which we gather are all gifts of God that give us tangible reminders of His hidden reality. God shows Himself to us in worship. When we do it right and when we are at our best, worship is a sign that points to the reality of God. But here's a very sad truth. When we make worship all about us and our preferences and our consumption, when we draw attention to ourselves or push our agendas or anything like that, God remains hidden and we don't see God in worship. But when we remember that worship is all about Him, about giving glory to our Lord Jesus Christ and proclaiming His truth, God shows Himself to us in mighty ways. We cannot see God. I think it's less of a matter of, being, of him being invisible and more the case of us being so small compared to him being so big and we can't take him all in. But worship is in an environment full of signs that remind us of his presence and his reality. Do this in remembrance of me. That's why we celebrate the Lord's Supper as an act of worship, to remember that he is real and that he is with us. You know, today is the first Sunday of May and one of the traditions that we have at First Presbyterian Church is to celebrate the Lord's Supper, the Sacrament of Holy Communion, on the first Sunday of each month. 
One of the most challenging aspects of this whole COVID-19 shutdown has been the inability to gather for worship and especially for Holy Communion. This is a point about which I have studied and debated and sought counsel. Other churches are handling this in other ways, and we're not here today to judge anyone else's action or the way they've interpreted this moment. But this has really troubled me. And so I've come to the conclusion that even though we could take a bit of bread and drink a bit of wine or grape juice, we could take those elements in some dispersed fashion, we're still missing one of the key elements of Holy Communion. Because Holy Communion is just not the same without the community of God's gathered people. I was troubled about this, and the other day I was sharing our dilemma in a group of other pastors. And one of our group, a member of our group, a good friend of mine, Reverend Patrick Gahan, rector of Christ Episcopal Church here in San Antonio, and I believe an expert in the sacraments, shared something with me that I thought was really enlightening and comforting and empowering. He said that like us, his parish was fasting from communion, fasting from the Holy Eucharist until the church can once again gather in person. But in the meantime, he had instructed his congregation to remember that the Eucharist, the sacrament, while a holy rite of the church that should not be taken casually or lightly, is not the only sign of Christ's presence with us or occasion for thanking Him for His good gifts. He said, I reminded our families that every time they gather for a meal, they should take some time while sitting at the table with one another to pray, to thank God for His providence, for His blessings and His presence, and to remember that Jesus' body was broken for us and that His blood was shed for us and that His resurrection was proven for us. He said, you don't have to wait for communion to remember those things around the table. It may not be the official Eucharist, but it is still an occasion for worship. I don't know what you will do later today over the course of the next 12 to 24 hours, but I'm willing to bet that at some point you will sit down to eat, either alone or with your family. I want to ask you to take some time during that meal to think about Jesus' body broken for you on the cross. I want you to take some time to think about His blood shed for you to seal a new covenant. And I want you to think about that time on the road when he sat down with two of his disciples and gave thanks and broke bread and their eyes were opened to the resurrected Jesus. It doesn't have to be the official sacrament to remember Jesus or what he has done and won for us. Luke tells us that after these disciples realized that Jesus had been with them the whole time. They said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. They became witnesses. They saw the risen Christ. They knew he was alive and they couldn't wait to tell. Jesus still approaches in ways that seem very ordinary. Through the strangers we meet, through the study of his word, through time spent in prayer, and in the signs of worship. They may be ordinary, but they are real. And I don't know how Jesus might reveal himself to you in other ways, but I do know how he has revealed to us now. And I believe that if we look for him where he may be found, he will not remain hidden and he will show himself to us. Would you pray with me? O oh Lord, our God, Heavenly Father, risen Christ, we know that you are with us, but so often we feel like you are hidden. Lord, please show yourself to us through the people around us and that we meet, through your word of scripture, 
through time we spend in prayer with you and through the signs of worship. Lord, help us to understand that you have not abandoned us, but you are with us every step of the way and that if we will seek you where you may be found, you will not remain hidden. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus the name above every Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside. the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Besides you, 
Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me I'd like to read to you from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. See, Jesus is the founder and perfecter of our faith. He is the firm foundation that we build our lives upon. We can look to him for hope, for peace, and for comfort. And when we fix our eyes on Christ, when we truly fix our eyes on Christ, the things of this earth, they cannot help but grow dim. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strange Lead him in the light of his glory is starting to open up again and we want to thank the Lord our God for giving us opportunities to go back to work to get together and hopefully one day to begin to plan for coming back together as the Church of Jesus Christ but we want to remember that there are still people in need who have suffered greatly through all of this who are going to need our help once life is reactivated there are still people who are going to be vulnerable when all of the rest of the population is ready to get out and be active again. And we want to be mindful of all of those people and their needs. And so as we prepare to reopen, as we prepare to, to celebrate what God has been doing for us in these times of quarantine and stay at home, we want to remember that God is still working and he is summoning us to look ahead at how we may continue to love Jesus Christ, to love one another, and love the city once we are all re-engaged in the world again. We hope that you'll want to be a part of that mission. And so if you're interested in learning more about First Presbyterian Church of San Antonio, we invite you to look to fpcsanantonio.org or to download the FPC app so that you can see everything that we offer and so that you can find ways to connect with our mission to love Jesus Christ, to love one another, and to love the city. And now, go forth into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.